Well, hello, everyone. Welcome to another edition of the latest Shiny podcast. With me in is Rob Hirschfeld. Rob, how are you doing? Stephen, happy new year. Happy new year to yourself. And uh, we have again another great guest. I think every time I introduce our guests, uh, one just keeps getting better. We have Tim Crawford, who is a CIO strategic advisor at Avoa. And I think I finally, for the first time, Tim, have said that correctly. It's, it's great to hear that. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> Thanks, Stephen, for uh, and Rob for having me, and Happy New Year to you both. I'm honored to uh, take part in your podcast. Great. So, uh, Tim, before we get going with all the questions, can you just take a quick minute and you know uh, provide a little insight into your background and what your role is uh, at Avoa? Sure. You know, it's it's an interesting place that I uh, I tend to sit in. So, I'm a former CIO uh, and spent the bulk of my career in the IT organization for large prominent firms and kind of shifted to helping those companies as an outsider, as an advisor to their tech strategy, but specifically where business and technology intersect. And so now I have a, um, uh, frankly, a very humble list of, of clients that I work with that range from a who's who list of large enterprises across a number of different uh, industries to um, a number of high-tech firms that are looking for a little bit of that inside baseball. Um, but think of me as the person that sits between business and business strategy and differentiation and transforming companies and leveraging technology as, a, as that strategic weapon. And so that isn't just about technology, it's about people, it's about process, it's about culture. And so all of that kind of comes together. So I advise companies on that. That actually tees up the first questions I would I would have for you, um, right? Because I've sat across the table from you in a, in a lot of meetings where you've been talking to investment bankers and analysts and people like that, and you are incredibly pragmatic. From a don't get distracted by the shiny, let's talk about the business value of it. Um, and at the same time, you know, I was reading some of your, your year end posts and talking about 2018 coming up for the audience. We are recording this. This is our, this is the first latest shiny we've recorded in 2018. So you're going to listen to this a little bit later. Um, but for us, new year's is very fresh. Um, and you, you were talking about, you know, sort of jumping in and picking technologies. This is daunting because companies have to make investments in the right thing. How do they know what the right thing is? How do they make that, that call? How do they know when to get off the sidelines on a technology? Yeah, that's, it's a great question and it's a complicated answer. Um, there isn't a straightforward answer to that. And in fact, one of the comments that quite often I hear from folks that executives that are bringing me in is, we're so overwhelmed with the different possibilities of technology that exist, we don't know where to start. And so they kind of get into this analysis paralysis state where, you know, even if you just talk about one aspect, cloud, if you talk about one aspect around DevOps, if you talk about one aspect around um, edge computing, each of these in its own right is overwhelming, but you have to remember these folks are, are having to run a company. And so it's not as simple as to, kind of sit on the sidelines and, and look and, and be able to observe objectively, they've got to keep that, you know, the, the old adage of got to keep the airplane in flight, even though you know you've got to replace one of the engines. So, so I think there are a couple of things there. Um, one is you got to pick apart the problem. Um, you know, don't try and, and I'll use a couple of analogies that we often use, but don't try and eat the elephant one bite. You've got to start somewhere. Uh, and I think that's the, the biggest challenge is getting to a culture of experimentation where you can start to try things out and see what works and do that in a meaningful way. But that's what I always advise folks is a, a good place to start is find something that is valuable, an area that's valuable, and try some things out. Some things will work, some things won't but learn from it and that'll help guide you for the next stage. Is there a flag that you look for when you're talking to an account that says you're in the wrong, you're, you're, you're double down on the wrong thing, right? You know, you, I picked, uh, <laughs> I'm going to go for like, you know, uh, there's, there's a ton of, of now that Kubernetes is, is the, is the 
de facto winner. I, I hate that, that actual analogy, but let's, company says, oh, we didn't pick Kubernetes, I picked one of the 20 alternatives. Uh, and how, what, what, do you, what do you have a company look for as far as flags of, oh, we've, we, we're in the wrong path, this is back out, back out, right? Retro rockets. Type. Yeah, I, I think there are a couple of indicators, a couple of markers, as I call them, that I look for. Number one is if they're spending a lot of time with the technology and don't understand why, um, meaning the value from a business perspective, that's usually a massive red flag. If you can't tie what you're doing and the choice you made around any given technology uh, back to a particular business outcome, and I don't mean just simply saying, oh, well, it's faster, oh, well, it's cheaper. No, I mean tying it back to a very tangible thing that you could sit in front of the executive team and be able to defend. Um, that's usually a, a pretty good indicator that um, you need to stop and think about the choices you're making. The second thing is, as I started this with, because I kind of pick apart these two pieces. Second piece is, if you're spending a lot of time with a given technology, you really have to ask yourself, is it, is it mature enough? Are you mature enough to be able to adopt that technology? Because it goes both ways, right? Right. Um, is it the right technology for your organization? Maybe it is, but maybe your organization isn't ready to adopt that kind of technology. Um, maybe it's too sophisticated for your, your capability. And that's not a hit against your organization, but there's a, there's a reality that comes into play where you have to decide where am I from a maturity standpoint organizationally and what am I capable of taking on? And maybe containers and Kubernetes is not something that you're capable of taking on yet, yet you're trying to, to dive into it head first. I mean, that's, that's a dangerous direction to take. So I look for, for things like that, those markers, those matches. Um, I think that starts to indicate other opportunities, but then also other potential challenges too. We, we see something very similar when we talk to our customers, right? They, they, it has to be very fast for them to understand what's happening, for them to get involved them to start using the technology um, but then you're right they have to be able to explain how it helps their business right how it's going to create value that it's not just uh, churn for churn's sake um, and I'm going to use that as a segue <laughs> into um, talking about security vulnerabilities a little bit um, without going into the tech um, January we saw early first week of the year um, two massive uh, supposedly massive vulnerabilities, at least in the, the impact to touch basically every CPU designed, built, and delivered since 1995. Um, that, that's blocking and tackling way down, down in the level. Um, can, can, C, can, can CIOs ignore that? What, what should they be doing? How should they be thinking? They've they got to fix things. How, do they, how should they be thinking about this? Yeah, I mean, it's, it's a big concern, right? It kind of, I think, uh, surprised us all to, to see it. But you also have to kind of take it with a grain of salt. I mean, what are you going to do? Rip out all of the CPUs that you have in your computing devices? I mean, that's just not realistic. And this is something that affects um, the myriad of different manufacturers. This is not just... Um, restricted to one particular chipset or one particular manufacturer, although it, some will probably threaten to go back to their 486s and, uh, you know, pre-1995. Actually, Pentium was pre-1995. Um, I think that the important thing there is to say, okay, this is, a, this is a big issue, but let's be mindful about it. Let's keep tabs on it figure out what we need to do from a hardware, from a software, from a firmware perspective, and let's make sure that we keep our eye on the ball with this. It's not something that the average enterprise is, is necessarily directly going to be able to do anything about, but once the manufacturers figure out how to resolve the issue, that's when the enterprises are going to have to figure out, okay, what do we need to change? Maybe it's something as simple as a patch going in. I've seen some... Um, uh, manufacturers that are have already issued software updates to be able to address some of the the components of the threats so there is a responsibility on the part of the enterprise but I think it's important to 
put these types of threats in the right place, which is not to ignore them, but rather to keep close tabs on them. And I think it's also a good opportunity just to check and recheck what you're doing from a cybersecurity standpoint and say, okay, what about the other aspects? Are there other ways that I can um, make sure that I've tightened up my application, my architecture, my environment in a meaningful way? And when I say meaningful way, I want to be clear about that because there are some uh, predominantly in the vendor community that say, oh, will you lock everything up like Fort Knox? The reality is if you were to do that, you're going to be out of business. I mean, you, this is a risk reward equation when it comes to cybersecurity. It always has been. And so you have to figure out what makes the most sense and make sure that you're, you're doing the right things. Now, I don't think that the majority are there yet, but um, I think this is a good wake up call and a good chance for us just to tap the brakes again and just say, okay, let's take another look and make sure that, that we're doing what we need to do. Well, to, to me, this is framed in an agility question just as much as it is in a security posture perspective because right, we're seeing increasing frequency of these very deep attack, you know, very deep vulnerabilities. They're not attacks, they're just vulnerabilities. But you know, your, your earlier comments about you might not be ready to jump into containers and Kubernetes yet. You have to, you have to do some investments in broader automation and processes and pipeline. You know, there's, there's a whole bunch of, of work to do to consume you know, some of the, the latest technologies. Um, if you're sitting back saying, oh, I'm, you know, I'll wait and patch the next one or I'll patch the next one or yeah, this one really was bad, but you know, it's, it took us a whole bunch of effort. Um, but I don't have to invest in the automation to automate, you know, keep up with these patches in advance. You're in trouble. Um, you can't, you can't treat these as, as, oh, this was the, the, the unique weird one that happened, you know, oh yeah, this will never happen again. That's not true. Well, I, I, I would say it, I'm not sure that I completely agree with that, Rob. Um, okay. in, in the sense that, I agree that you have to look at every patch, you have to look at every vulnerability and take it seriously. But there is a real cost. There is a very real cost to an enterprise to patch for a vulnerability. And so there is a risk reward perspective that you have to play into that. I mean, if you're constantly patching every single vulnerability that comes along every single time it comes along, that's going to be incredibly disruptive. Now, you're right. If you have certain levels of automation in place and processes that it, it kind of streamlines the actual patching process, that's one thing. But the reality is that most enterprises don't have that and definitely don't have that um, widespread across their computing uh, environment. And so it may be something as simple as, okay, this is a serious one, so let's go ahead and patch it now. Or it may be, you know what, this one isn't as serious. Let's wait for the next patching, to the next set of patches to come, and we'll do all of them at the same time. So you kind of bulk it up, right? I mean, you almost have um, a similar conversation that happens. It's a little different, but it's a similar conversation as to why companies don't upgrade to each point version of an application every time it comes out. It's because it's an incredibly disruptive process and you have to balance that against all of your other requirements that are coming in the front door. Um, it's, so it's, not as, it's easy to say in a vacuum, okay, well, is this a risk for us? Sure, so let's patch it. But the reality is the, the average enterprise has to balance that against what's the disruption in order to do it, what's the amount of resources required to do it, to test it, to evaluate it, and then to actually hit the button and, and do the patching. And then if something does go sideways, what's our remediation so we can back it out, so we can go back and revisit it. I mean, there, there are a number of steps you have to go through as an enterprise. This is, this is why I love talking with you, because right, the, the mantra that, that I hear and the one that I'm sort of steeped in is fast, continuous, non-disruptive changes, right? Batching, batching changes like you're describing is antithetical to a lot of the, 
DevOps and SRE um, religion, for lack mm -hmm. of a better word, that, that I hear. Um, and so, you know, I think, you know, when I think about, when I, when I think about this, it's like, look, you, we have to get everybody into a position where they can make a fleet wide change and be confident that it's going to work because they're doing it every day or every week. And, and that is good operational hygiene. Yeah. And you're, you're saying, Rob, you're right. It sounds like, I mean, I, I don't think you're going to disagree with me that that's good hygiene, but you're saying, but it doesn't, don't, don't beat yourself up if you're not there. Well, I do agree with you. That is good hygiene, but the reality is that most organizations aren't there across the board. I mean, if we go back to this vulnerability that was, that was identified in January, I mean, that's going to affect every server, every appliance, every desktop, every mobile device. You're, you're going to have a number of of different categories of devices that need to be addressed. And so now it's not as simple as, okay, well, we'll move workloads over to another server and then we'll, we'll patch that server and then move that, move those workloads back. And so the users kind of don't see it versus we got to roll this out to every single desktop in our entire organization. If you've got a hundred thousand desktops, I mean, that's, it's a significant amount of work. And if, one of those patches breaks something else, maybe one of your custom apps. I mean, that's, that's yet another problem. And that's why you, you have this inertia and, and you cannot ignore the fact that there is a phenomenal amount of inertia that's been built up over the last three to four decades in computing and IT that is preventing us and holding us back from being able to get to that really hygienic point of where you can press a button and have confidence that it can be rolled out and it's actually going to work. Yeah. We and, so my and, point isn't that I disagree with you. I, I do agree with you. It'd be great to have that, but we can't get from here to there overnight. And to, me, and to me, when I think about people trying to make these technology decisions, right, that, that you're describing, you know, that we started with, of I've got you know, I have to be able to be very agile in making decisions and be able to pivot and adjust those decisions after I make them. One of the things that, that to me makes sense to do is to look at the hygiene of those changes that you add in. Don't just go back and say, I'm going to replace, you know, hard to patch custom, you know, software that changes twice, you know, twice a decade with a new version of said software when you know, you know that that's just the, the pace of vulnerabilities or the pace of bugs or the pace of change is gonna make it, make that a bad investment. Yeah. Does that make, is that, am I saying that right? Yeah, again, I get it. I, t I totally get it and I'm with you. But I'll also say that the conversations that happen within the enterprise are such that, yeah, okay, that's great. But is this patch going to break any of our custom applications, if you're a bank, or is it gonna break any of our custom, really complicated core banking applications? And if the answer is, I don't know, or anything less than absolutely not, which, I mean, getting to that absolutely not perspective is, is kind of moving mountains, but anything less than that is gonna cause a leader to have a little bit of concern. And so then there's a process you have to go through to be able to get there. Yeah. I, and this, this to me, there's, there's a whole nother rant that I won't indulge in. Uh, but this, this is where if your team is running flat out 100% all the time, then what you described is a, you know, a, a company threatening motion, right? You make a change that has some ripple effect and all of a sudden you, everything else stops while you unwind that or, pa or forward patch it, or figure out what to of do. Of course, of course. And so some, some of the, what we're describing, <laughs> the simplest thing to do is make sure that your, your team has spare capacity to absorb this, this type of thing, because it's going to come and bite you. Um, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to drag us from that into a, a similar topic, but that should get people thinking along the same lines, which is of edge. Because one of the challenges is with edge, very new, very fast moving. You're going to have to be making patches and changes and dealing with infrastructure that you have even less, potentially less access to. Um, 
So to me, what you just described is amplified in an edge conversation. We love to talk about edge on this podcast. Um, can you back up? Give me your definition of edge. What, what are you thinking about edge before we drive into more detailed questions? Sure. I mean, edge is everything from sensors and devices to computing components um, that sits beyond the data center. So it could be something that's kind of an intermediate stage. It could be something that is at the very edge, meaning it's a sensor on a mechanical device. It's a, it's a controller for a robot. It could be um, a wearable device uh, that a person uses. I think edge brings a number of interesting opportunities and also a number of interesting challenges that we have kind of started to touch on when we when we ventured into this mobile space but we really didn't wrap our heads completely around and then you run into the other problem which is orphaned edge devices and then that becomes a real risk because unlike the corporate data center or even the cloud where you have control over and i'm using that word control very very carefully um, because I am not a fan of command and control as a uh, philosophy. But when you have control over devices and computing and data, that's one thing. As you start to get to the edge, you lose control. You lose the ability to be able to control those devices because they're physically not in a secured location. Um, even a desktop computer that uh, sits in someone's office, that's a, that's a fairly secure uh, location. There's probably a lock somewhere between the public street and where that computer sits. Maybe it's just the front door. Maybe it's the office lock. Um, but when you start talking about mobile devices, when you talk about smaller devices, wearables, I mean, those are easily lost, easily damaged. Uh, and then you start having other issues that come into play. But all of the negativity around that needs to be solved because the upside is massive. And we absolutely need to figure out how to solve some of these challenges. What, what type of upside? Where, where, well, I mean, so, right, I want to talk about the control aspects and the vulnerabilities too, but what, you know, why, why not just wait? On, on, on edge? Why does it have to be on a CIO's radar today? That's a great question. It, edge, like many of these conversations we've had, uh, many of these topics that we've talked about in this podcast, have to be on the CIO's radar if they're not already there because their competition is already thinking about it. If your target, you're thinking about, well, if you're target, you're probably thinking about other things today. But um, if your target you're thinking about how do we start to engage our customer in a very different way, similar to how Walmart might have. Um, if you're a manufacturing company, you're thinking about edge from the perspective of computing devices and sensors all the way out to the manufacturing line. Um, and interestingly enough, as you get further out to the edge, you actually create a problem with this other concept called cloud computing because of this little physics problem called the speed of light. And so it creates an interesting challenge, but at the same time, Edge presents an opportunity to get greater visibility into what's happening on a grander scale, because now you can, you can create small sensors. I mean, there are sensors that are, uh, they cost pennies to purchase, and they've been around for a long time in, in certain uh, verticals, but now on the broad spectrum, there are sensors that you can buy for pennies a piece that provide you insights onto, um, well, I'll give you an example. So uh, air, aircraft manufacturer, uh, they do maintenance on the engines. And so they wanna be able to, they might have, um, might have something with this rack that supports that particular engine when they take it off the plane to, to do work on it. Well, what if they put a weight sensor on it? Okay, well, what can that tell us? That little weight sensor. That little weight sensor can tell us 
what engine is actually on it because that fits into certain parameters. It can tell us if the rack is actually being used or not. And if you add that with a GPS sensor, now you can tell where that engine is, what type of engine based on its parameters. So now you start adding a couple of little pieces to this workflow and you start getting incredible insights as to what's where, when, how, why that you might have only been able to do manually. And that we all know that manual, that human interaction piece is fraught with errors and it's time consuming. So now you get immediate access to data. And of course we hear about the oil rigs and the cruise ship examples, which which I kind of joke and <laughs> say, cruise ship examples. I don't, I don't want to hear any more about oil rigs and cruise ships. I want to hear about, <laughs> you know, kind of the everyday person. Um, and just about every industry has this. Retail has this in terms of packages, uh, in terms of customer engagement. Um, air, major aircraft have this. Commercial real estate have this. I mean, every industry has a story to tell about how edge computing can change the way they differentiate themselves from their competition. And, and we, we did a podcast with Dave McCrory that covered some of these topics. Um, and and people, should, people should reference back to that because I'm about to, to, to point out what you're describing to me is a, a huge abundance of data mm -hmm. that's going to drive decision making that has millisecond response time in it. Um, or in your airplane example, you might sensor data is so cheap, you might start putting sensors on things to collect data and not even know what the inferences are yet and just say, oh, I'm going to take all the data I have and then do deep learning on it to see if there's actually some weird correlation between red bags on the left side of the plane and where, where on, on the engine. Um, yeah. And interestingly enough, there are products, not specific to edge, but you can feed edge data into them that will look for that inference and actually present you with interesting correlations. So it's, a, it's an analytical engine that'll pre present you with interesting inference correlations that you might not have otherwise thought. Meaning if you make this change over here, it can affect this other thing way on the other side of your workflow. And a human may not have made that inference but because we now have access to that data in an automated way, in an electronic way, we can make those inferences, we can determine those correlations, and now we have a much richer context that helps our business either from an efficiency standpoint, when we're looking at internal metrics, or from an engagement standpoint in terms of how we differentiate our business, how we engage with our customer. Those are massive, massive agenda opportunities, not just for the CIO, but for the executive team and the board of directors. So when you look at that framing, is there a material from a CIO's perspective, is edge really different is it, than cloud is? Where, where's the, is, is, there, is there like a dividing line where you're like, oh, that's edge, this is cloud? We just blended everything together, it sounds like. Yeah, I, you know, I, I mean, I know you know this, Rob, and I think, you know, Stephen and I have had this conversation probably a couple of times. Um, I look at more as a continuum and how it's being used as opposed to a discrete definition. I generally don't like to get into the discrete definitions because there's always a way to counteract how you define something. I mean, is it edge? Is it cloud? I mean, at some point, does it matter? Does, what I mean, the only people who who might care about that are the marketing folks that are trying to compare themselves to a differentiating product. Um, but at the end of the day, cloud edge, these are all just different tools in a spectrum of different tools that we need to leverage that ultimately will help us change the way we we operate our business. Right. Uh, to me, that's a huge takeaway. Because right, I, I go to a lot of edge meetings, and the, the the meme for me is every edge meeting starts with a, you know, a forty five minute edge meeting starts with thirty minutes of of people arguing about what does edge mean. Um, 
at, at which point, right, my eyes get broken from rolling so hard because of exactly what you're saying. We, do we, you know, do we have to define it as this many milliseconds of latency and this small of a cluster and, you know, these things? And actually, maybe I should ask you that question. Do you feel, do you feel a need to define edge in, in that way to discuss it? No, not at all. Okay. Not at all. I mean, the, the edge is more of a, um, more nebulous than that. <laughs> kind of bringing so, in a pun here. Um, it's, <laughs> Don't say fog. No, yeah, well, no, it's not, but you know, it's again, I think like to your point, so you've got the 45 minute meeting, you've spent 30 minutes defining it. What have we gained from that argument? We did the same thing with cloud. I mean, you remember this, I do. We did the same thing. So what exactly is cloud? How do you define cloud? Ah, make it stop. I mean, let's talk about how we can leverage these resources in a meaningful way. I think the problem is we're always looking to define things because that's the way we relate to what we already know rather than stepping out of the box and saying, okay, how do we use this in a meaningful way? Whether it's called edge or cloud or, or fog or nebulous, I mean, who cares? I mean, let's, let's focus on what we need to do. We need something that can provide us greater insights at the boundaries of our organization, whether that be physical devices, whether that be people, but we need those insights. How do we do that? And it might be, it might be an individual component, it might be a sensor, it might be a combination of that along with, uh, along with other, other components. Um, yeah. I, so and yeah. Along, along those lines, one of the things that, that, uh, that, I, that I see when I look at Edge is and in cloud together is we're not we're not looking at new tools new concept i mean there, there will be without a doubt not that's what i want to talk about next um but um you're you're not going to have edge with a different paradigm of operation than cloud is is sort of my my sense of right people we don't need a new a, you know reinventing things what you're describing is a continuum so things that are working in cloud are going to be applied back to edge, just like I think cloud's coming back into corporate IT in a big way. It, it is and it isn't. I mean, there, I kind of wrote a little bit about this, and I'm actually in, in uh, the middle of another post about this. Um, there, there's the continuum of cloud, and I think there will be some components that sit within a corporate data center that look like cloud. Um, is it cloud? Is it not? I, you know, I'm not going to go there in terms of trying to define it. The important thing is there are different delivery mechanisms and different ways that we need to leverage technology. Sometimes at the extremes, you know, talking about the very extremes, sometimes that might be in a, a very shared infrastructure like public cloud. In other cases, it may be some form of resources sitting in your corporate data center. In other cases, it may be something sitting out in the field. Um, the, the point is, let's spend less time worrying about defining. And if we put that energy toward figuring out what problem that's going to solve, we would advance ourselves so much further than where we are. But the problem is we still have a massive gap. And this is one of the challenges for the CIO and the CIO's agenda is there's a massive gap between the technologist that wants to talk about technology and the business leader that wants to figure out what business problem we're solving. <laughs> That's why the podcast is called The Later Shiny. <laughs> um, yeah, we, we do uh, love to talk about tech. You, you, you seems to me avoided the word hybrid. Um, is, do, you, do you think the word hybrid is, is going to go out of phase or is it just it's like cloud. It's the new IT reality. Just get over it. It's so to, hybrid is just, again, I think, you know, let's be careful about not trying to define it because one thing I, I did do, I wrote a post on avoa.com trying to help people in a very simple way understand the differences between multi-cloud and hybrid cloud. Um, and when you say hybrid, I'm assuming you're referring to hybrid cloud. 
but <laughs> I was starting to hear vendors interchange those, those terms. And very simply put, one to me means on a horizontal level, how you're comparing different solutions versus a vertical level. So horizontally, multi-cloud, you're looking at similar products in a similar tier. Hybrid cloud, you're looking at products that span up and down tiers. So it's a vertical versus horizontal conversation. And that's pretty much where I ended it intentionally because I didn't want to dive into this kind of um, discussion or banter around, well, but it's gotta be this shade of blue or that shade of green. And it, right. at the end of the day, it doesn't matter. The point is, figure out what solutions make sense, what technologies make sense, and leverage them in a meaningful way. When you start doing that, all of this other conversation starts falling off. You still need to talk technology. You still need to get into the, the bits and bytes, but you, it makes it easier to be able to connect the dots. I, I strongly agree. The, to me, hybrid is really a proxy word for heterogeneity. People just don't like to say heterogeneity because <laughs> they can't spell it. Um, but it's, it's this acknowledgement that what we've got is, you know, we're not picking from single vendors, um, big vertically integrated stacks from one or two vendors. Um, we're, we're in a, you know, I'm using, I've got on-premises gear, I've got cloud gear, I've got maybe multiple clouds, I've got different operators. It's, 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 a, it's, a, it's a mess. Um, and I, you know, I feel like the conversation is, is moving um, away from trying to just say everything's going to be on Amazon, although there's still people doing that. Do, do you think that, you know, it, the vendor landscape feels like it's been sort of converging into these, these new behemoths, right? The Amazons and, and back to Microsoft, Microsoft's resurgence or Google. Um, feels good like and, and red hat dominating the open source space it, it it feels like it's getting a little boring from a vendor landscape perspective again is do you, do you think that you know where, where do you see these big vendors interacting is there still space for new interesting disruption so i do think there is a bit of consolidation but you know if you look at it as a pendulum that swings back and forth we've seen over the course of time, at least over the course of my career, um, which now is spanning close to three decades, almost three decades uh, as of, oh crap, three decades as of this year. Um, okay, so 30 years in, we gotta come to terms with that. But, you know, we've seen this pendulum kind of go back and forth, right? And it swings from, okay, there's all of this innovation, there's this plethora of new, new tools, and that's great, and it's sexy, and it's new, and it's fresh, and it's cool, but then we gotta figure out what to do with it. And so you could almost kind of boil it down into a conversation of which is better. Best to breed, where you take the best solution for every single, I'm, I'm talking about the extremes here, you take the best of breed solution for every single need, every single demand, every single problem has a different solution that it leverages. Or do you center on the monolithics and leverage the monolithics uh, across even though some of those aspects aren't necessarily the best solution, but because it is from that, that core company, um, the integration and, and contracts and the way they do things, all of those things are, are very similar. Which is the better approach? And the short answer is neither. Neither is the best approach. And frankly, companies generally don't do either of those extremes. They sit somewhere in the middle. There are some things that make sense to use a monolithic approach, and there are other aspects that it makes sense to use a best of breed product. But the important thing from a leadership perspective is you have to think about when it makes sense to do that versus not doing that. In some cases, it's gotten, the pendulum has swung too far in toward the best of breed products where procurement groups and enterprises have said, if you're gonna bring a new vendor in, you must eliminate two vendors because there are way too many vendors that are in the mix. And frankly, 
you oh. can't manage them all. I mean, managing vendors is managing a relationship and you can realistically only manage a certain number of relationships. And we could have a whole conversation about what that means. But so, the point here is you've got to find that balance between when it makes sense to leverage those large uh, products in those large companies and when it makes sense to leverage a point solution. So what, what you're describing to me with the best of breed it is I could have substituted the word open source because open source typically is not vertically integrated stuff, right? OpenStack, I think, was trying to do that, and it didn't, doesn't turn out as easy to manage as they were hoping, I'll say it that way. Um, and so, you know, a lot of companies are looking at open source. Part of the, this best of breed thing is, you know, plugging open source technologies in, and then you throw in the relationship piece and supporting that open source stuff. What does open source look like to the CIO from that perspective? Well, so the, the first thing that I would, um, I would disagree with is I don't think of open source as best of breed, that those are interchangeable. Open source is another, um, another delivery mechanism, another way to consume software uh, similar to a commercial product. And whether it's open source or a commercial product, it could still be best of breed. So I don't think one is necessarily related to the other. But when you talk about open source, I think the important thing, and I love the analogy of open source is free like a puppy. Um, because so many folks don't think about the true value that open source brings. What they focus on is, oh, cool, it's free software. Let me go ahead and use it. What they don't think about is the importance and the value that comes from contributing to a project, contributing back to um, the particular software that they're consuming and using and, and being a part of that community. You know, open source requires a different type of relationship than a commercial piece of software, a very different relationship. Many folks don't understand the differences between those, which is a challenge. Um, and some of them find out the hard way once they pull down the open source product and then they're like, oh wait, who do I call for support? Oh nuts, and now it's in production, what do we do? Uh, and then they're looking for ways to either get support or, or back out of it, which is unfortunate because I think that's, that just speaks to kind of the ignorance around going into this conversation on where it makes sense to leverage open source. I think it's important, you know, and, and I do hear this with CIOs is that it's important to understand when to leverage open source and when not to leverage open source and understand the reasons why you're doing that. And it's less about technology and it's more about other aspects. It could be about your organizational capability. Maybe your organization is trying to use a, um, let's say the operational team, not the dev team, but let's say the ops team is trying to use an open source product, but the bench doesn't have development skills. Sure, they've got scripting skills, but they don't have development skills. That might be a huge hindrance to their capability to be able to contribute back to the collective, back to the community and engage with the community. And so then you'd at, you have to ask yourself, okay, so am I just a consumer of open source at that point and not really part of the community, which I think kind of is a miss because I think the real value of open source comes from the combination of what open source stands for, but also the community uh, that comes with it. Or do you take a different tact altogether? These are conversations that each organization has to answer for themselves in each of their ways. I think it would be arrogant for me to stand here and say, okay, this is what you need to do. This is what, where open source fits in or doesn't fit in because it's less about technology and it's more about, um, it's more about the organization. And frankly, I think that's why projects like, um, like OpenStack um, really struggled is that you're talking about an operational group that is not the most astute, generally speaking, when it comes to development chops. And that's not a hit against ops folks. I started my career in operations. I spend a lot of time in my career in operations. 
And so I have mad respect for what it takes to effectively run an operations organization and be a member of an operations team. But you're talking about asking someone who doesn't necessarily have a background in development to contribute. And that's, that's like oil and water. And so we have to bridge those gaps. We have to find ways to bridge those gaps. And that is changing, but it's important to understand these complexities when you talk about open source. All right, I am chomping at the bit to, to take, <laughs> take what you just said into smaller pieces for discussion. But, but I have to stop you. <laughs> but we, we, we don't have time. So, uh, Tim, I, this one, I'd love to open this one back up in a, in a future, in a future podcast, because that's an hour topic in itself. I love the way you, you frame it. Uh, all right, Stephen, you want to outro us? Yeah, so, so Tim, thank you again for joining us. And I apologize for everyone who just as we got into the open source part, but we will certainly bring Tim back. Tim, if anyone wants to get a hold of you, uh, where should they go? How should they contact you? Best way is uh, catch me on Twitter at T Crawford, T C R A W F O R D, or you can contact me through the blog um, at avoa.com, A V O A.com. Thanks well, for having me, guys. Hey, thanks for joining. And my apologies for being quiet, but in the background, I had a delivery that took some time, but Rob certainly had plenty of good questions. So thank you both again. Look forward to talking again soon. That was awesome. Thank you both. Thank you.